How can climate storytelling help us reckon with our changing environment? Climate One conversations feature all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the exciting and the scary, people who are in power and disempowered. I'm Greg Dalton. First, the weather changed. The deniers knew why, but they still doomed us with their lies. War made the earth even hotter. Her ice melted and all her species crashed. In the past decade, narratives of a dystopian climate future have helped connect people with characters and worlds decimated by industrial expansion and climate disruption. In the real world, scientists are looking to geoengineering and other innovations to help preserve the well-being of life on Earth. 20 years ago, we were writing about this, and you're just a journalist off on a wild goose chase, or you're a science fiction writer portraying an implausible future. Now everybody's there. Kim Stanley Robinson is an award-winning science fiction author of more than 20 books, including the best-selling Mars Trilogy. His most recent novel is The Ministry for the Future, which uses fictional eyewitness accounts to tell the story of a climate future that may not be so far off. Controlled flooding to counteract the effects of flood control. And that's really the theme of the book, these sort of interventions that then demand new interventions on top of them. Elizabeth Colbert is a staff writer with The New Yorker and author of The Sixth Extinction, which won a Pulitzer Prize. Her new book is Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. She and Kim Stanley Robinson will join us later in the program. First, telling climate stories of the past and present. If you approach climate narratives as ultimately as cultural historians, as cultural storytellers, I I think we can begin to understand that it's about the people. Jeff Biggers founded the Climate Narrative Project in 2014 to help train a new generation of storytellers and reshape the narratives around fossil fuels. The project was inspired by some of his own struggles as a journalist and historian. I've been writing about the coal industry and energy and the environment for years, if not decades. And a lot of that came out, of course, of personal experience. My family's 200-year-old family farm was strip mined in southern Illinois in 1998 when I was working on a book abroad. I was living down with the Raramuri, the Tauromara in northern Mexico, who were dealing with massive deforestation. And so here I was chronicling what was happening to indigenous people in Mexico uh, during an extraordinary drought, seven years of drought that had led to famine. And I received a letter from my uncle letting me know that, you know, our farm that had been in our family for 200 years um, had been strip mined. And he essentially said, what are you doing chronicling what's happening in the rest of the world when you're not even aware of what's happening to our own family? So it it brought me back, um, you know, this is more than 20 years ago, to really analyze how the coal industry had treated my region. My region is uh, really the, the place where coal was first discovered by Europeans, the French in the 1600s, of course, amongst the Shawnee along the Illinois River, and then further down in southern Illinois, where I'm from, became really one of the great coal countries and coal fields uh, in American history. It had left my region in ruins and it had left uh, my own family in ruins, you know, both from suffering as coal miners with black lung to the massive environmental degradation to having a, a, a county that always ranked in the lowest uh, categories for health factors in the economy, just entrenched poverty and despair in 19. 19- 32, there was a study talking about some of the most hopeless areas in the country. They were called stranded communities. We had the highest infant mortality rate uh, in the nation. And they pinpointed Southern Illinois, exactly my county, as really one of the worst um, uh, counties for this uh, in the country. And I tried to bring that up to date and say, how come after a century, if not centuries, of, of this experience with the coal industry, have we not been able to tell a proper story to get people to act, both to defend the land, to defend the people, to defend coal miners, and now to bring it into the climate age, to realize that you know our, our number one contributor to CO2 emissions was the coal industry. And so for years, Greg, you know, I was filing these stories and working with uh, all sorts of uh, news agencies and magazines and radio, and, and you have it to try to tell this story And I felt like we just simply failed, you know? We failed to get across the true humanitarian environmental crises that was facing our nation from people who were living on the front lines of extraction. And that forced me to stop what I was doing, 
and to say, hey, I need to uh, regroup here and reassess my role as a writer, as a storyteller, and find new ways to come up with a better narrative. And so for that, that's sort of a long way of talking about how I began the Climate Narrative Project. Well, this past year, a lot of our country, and and I personally have learned about the stories we tell ourselves and how flawed they are, the American narrative, and how uh, it excludes so many people and literally whitewashes us in so many ways. So the stories we tell ourselves, there's a lot, a lot there. And the coal miners, you know, have this iconic place in the American mythology, you know, with a gritty face. And it just seems to hold a very uh, special place, that coal miner narrative. Right. And then part of that mythology is just uh, a lot of misinformation. You know, think about it still today, three coal miners die daily from black lung disease. And yet we've struggled to get the, the proper legislation to cover that. My own grandfather and members of my family have struggled with uh, black lung disease. But at the same time, there's a sizable part of our communities who've had to live with coal mining both uh, as people who are family members or people who just find themselves in this region, people who are indigenous. You know, we have uh, strip mining going on in 20 odd states and and several First Nations. And those people are having to live with the effects of coal mining as well in terms of water that's polluted and air that's polluted and and, uh, and roads that are completely devastated and, and a certain way of life that is analogous to a war zone. And I feel like that was an extraordinary story that we've lost because we've often kind of fallen into the mythology of the coal miner that I was very much a part of in my family coming from a coal mining family. What are the most important elements of an effective climate narrative? What are the ingredients that have been missing to really have these stories take hold and kind of soften the mythology? Well, let's let's go back to what had failed and what I had found that failed. I found that if we just simply want to relay the data that people perhaps are not able to take that data and and put it into everyday context of everyday lives. Because ultimately, any of these good ideas that we wanted to shift uh, into policy, it was failing because there wasn't community buy-in. There was kind of this implementation gap. It was people who just simply didn't see how this related to them or how they would want to support it. So the climate narrative idea is how do we flip that, recognize that there's a communication crisis as much as a a climate crisis that we're having to deal with? And how do we find creative ways using the narrative arts to tell the story in a way that allows us to envision change, allows us to reroute ourselves back in our communities, and also allows us to see the experience of other people? Um, And I think this is particularly when we begin to talk about climate justice and environmental justice. And so that was the direction I was shifting that we can really explore is how we look at these three areas through storytelling to help really connect people back into what's happening. When I looked at your work, it seems that you place relationships at the center rather than issues. So often people come at these issues with kind of, you know, facts and figures and policies, but they don't, as you said, they don't really land with people. There's a, you call it an implementation gap. So I'm interested in how important relationships are, because that seems to be the missing, one of the missing ingredients. You know, I think often uh, the novelist, there's a, a very famous thing that uh, it's really not about what happens, to, but it's about who it happens to. It's about the people, and it's really characters and conflicts. You know, my training is not as a journalist. I, I began to study journalism when I was in school at the University of California, Berkeley, but ultimately I shifted over to oral history. So my training was as an oral historian, and it really was a matter of how we would take Uh, hours, if not days, if not weeks and months, to simply sit and listen to people and, and, and find out what really was important to them and to realize how they uh, particularly framed a story or the importance of that story in their own lives. And so if you approach climate narratives through this perspective, as ultimately as cultural historians, as cultural storytellers, as opposed to uh, analysts or political uh, activists or reporters, I, I think we can begin to understand that it's much more complex than we can ever imagine, that it's about the people and it's about how those people relate to us and how we relate to them in their er- everyday lives. Um, you know, and once again, when we start talking about narrative arts in storytelling, I, I think it's important to say it's just not simply about what we're doing now, talking, uh, or it's about um, doing monologues or theater works or radio work. It's, it's storytelling in the narrative arts is also about films and photography. It's about visual arts and painting. It's about dance and uh, 
and using all sorts of forms of, of performance to, to tell that story as well. Uh, I had one student in, I wanted to show as a, a unique example who went up and, and spent several days at Standing Rock during the, the uprising there to stop the pipeline. And what was fascinating is this student was also an artist who really wanted to capture the stories that she was hearing, and she didn't really know how to do it. Uh, so what she was affected by was the, the beautiful plains and the beautiful scenes that she saw. And, and, and she visited several indigenous communities and she came back and did this gorgeous painting of the world that she was visiting and trying to understand as an outsider, as a, someone of a European American background. And she goes on to stage with this extraordinary painting, something that you would imagine from our great Grant Wood, you know, out of Iowa something that was beautiful, something you'd want to take home and put on your wall. And in the midst of the stage, she gets a can of black oil and completely douses this beautiful panorama that she had painted, you know, giving us the story of, of what she had heard about, you know, pipelines don't leak, they burst. And ultimately we're going to potentially go into the Missouri river or the Mississippi river, or ultimately into the lands of indigenous people. And that was her way of using narrative arts through visual arts to tell a story that ultimately perhaps I couldn't capture as well if I was going to do it through a, a different medium, be it radio or what. Yeah, I'm getting chills hearing that. And the very powerful artists are often on the vanguard of social change, you know, play this role of interpreting. One genre you didn't mention, I've heard you talk about, is uh, children's stories. Stories like Dr. Seuss, the Lorax, have put human impact on the environment into simple, understandable terms that most kids and adults can understand and remember for a long time. What special role can children's books play in shaping a broader social narrative? I had a student who uh, was a, a chemistry PhD, and he wanted to tell the stories of the prairies in Iowa and, and the amazing transformation that has happened to our state. You know, I'm not from Iowa, I'm from Southern Illinois where we're used to strip mining, and I didn't realize that Iowa is the most altered state in the union. 99% of the prairies have been eradicated. And so these great rolling areas of corn and beans that we see that ultimately define our state, you know, when it rains here, you know, you have a 78% chance that a drop of rain is going to fall on the cornfields. That's all new. That's something that has come from the devastation of our natural environment. Um, and so he wanted to tell what was the impact of losing our prairies. And he felt the only way he could do that, someone with a PhD in chemistry, was to write a children's book. And to show that, you know, the, the prairie grasses had these roots that would go, you know, 10, 12, 14 feet deep would really hold together. And that's what gave us this incredible, you know, uh, glacial uh, soil that we have today. That's really one of the great captures of the carbon capture sequestration. And he, the idea was how do we reclaim our prairie roots in Iowa and begin to regrow and transition from industrial agriculture more to regenerative agriculture. And he began to tell that story through a children's book that had us all spellbound. I mean, here he was, and for his final performance, we had children come in and he read it to them and he had fascinating little drawings he had done himself. And it was spellbinding for adults to hear that because some of us didn't really understand the importance of the prairies in our own backyard. Um, I think what's really important, Greg, is to see that part of this is rerouting ourselves. You know, why use the climate narrative, for example, with many cities and towns and working with urban planners to envision our future? And how do we want to get to where we want to be 20 years from now, 10 years from now as a regenerative city? But part of envisioning that future is to take a step back and try to understand our history. And I think that rerouting and going back and telling stories and collecting stories, uh, both oral histories and just other cultural histories to understand where we are geographically, our human geography, our, our transitions as, as migrants as whatnot, the role of indigenous people, the role of rivers, the role of wherever we might be in terms of our, our, our biological communities. That's all part of the envisioning process and that's all part of storytelling. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about telling the climate story. Coming up, we'll hear about new books from New Yorker writer Elizabeth Colbert and science fiction author Kim Stanley Robinson. Plus more from Jeff Biggers on the need for climate storytellers. What we're missing is the way to galvanize engagement, galvanize people to support policies that are actually gonna change. And that's only, I feel like, can happen when we have effective climate storytelling. That's up next when Climate One continues. <laughs> 
This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guest is Jeff Biggers, founder of the Climate Narrative Project. Later, we'll hear from science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson, whose new novel is set in a not-so-distant future of deadly heat waves and cutthroat competition for food and air conditioners. But Jeff Biggers says that addressing climate doesn't need to be about avoiding such dystopian scenes with Blade Runner soundtracks. We don't have to be naive and, and uh, stick our head in the sand. You're talking to someone who spent pretty much my life interviewing people who have lived in devastated uh, areas of extraction. You know, I've spent, uh, I don't know how many years of my life interviewing people who live around mountaintop removal mining, you know, literally where thousands of pounds of explosives every day, still today, are going off, destroying both our mountains, but destroying our waterways and any sorts of a uh, uh, future. There's that trauma. And I think that trauma also now is happening uh, with climate change and climate crisis. Uh, here in Iowa, for example, we have so many climate refugees coming from the Sudan. The second largest community of people from the Marshall Islands are in Iowa now. You know, people who've literally have had to leave their islands, not only because of the radiation of the nuclear testing, but also now from the flooding of their island. So how do we not stick our head in the sands or have some dystopic future? The idea is to actually realize where we are now and where we want to be in the future and how we begin to see the regenerative practice, which ultimately, you know, if we look at regeneration, the large part about it is that it begins to heal the environmental and industrial damage that we've done to the planet. You know, last summer here in Iowa, we went through uh, one of our derechos, these massive windstorms. It's, you know, analogous to a tornado, but it's even different. It was considered a level three land hurricane, 120 miles an hour came through our, our area. In fact, right outside my window, several of our trees went down. We lost our electricity for a week. All the streets were blocked off. The nearby city of Cedar Rapids lost 60% of its, its uh, canopy, its trees. And so how do we begin to rebuild and regenerate and ultimately repair this kind of damage, you know, going into the future, which is going to be dealing with all sorts of climate emergencies? And I think that's where storytelling helps us. It tells us, okay, this is where we're from. This is our geological, environmental, biological community. And this is how we have to get our resources to re replenish what we're doing. That does it make sense to be importing our energy, trucking in coal, training in coal to burn it and then see its impact that ultimately we, uh, loops back to disrupt us even more? And does it make sense that 92% of all of Iowa's food is imported when we should be able to grow it here today? And all that is part of getting beyond the apocalypse, getting beyond the dystopic, to actually taking charge of where we are now and saying, hey, there's something we can do about it. We have to roll up our sleeves and storytelling is a way to, to go about it. When Bro President Biden mentions climate, he talks about jobs, jobs, jobs. But you say that is not the best way to craft a climate narrative. Why? You know, because we've got to get beyond the idea that we simply can just put a solar panel on our house and we're going to be okay. You know, I, I think the the idea is that we have to go deeper. We have to realize it's it's a much greater transformation, both of our economy and our way of lives, that's going to change things. By the way, with us talking right now, I have solar panels on my house, plus I get 60% of my electricity from wind industry. So theoretically, we're almost 100% renewable energy here uh, in the heartland and corn country. And that's simply not enough. It's simply not enough if we're going to be able to turn the ship around and go to, to a way that's going to effectively change uh, for the future and deal with this climate emergency. And I think that's part of looking at what the actual history is in these regions. If you're talking about Southern Illinois or West Virginia or other traditional coal country, and once again, in 20 odd states and, and First Nations, you have to understand the history and the geography and the transportation routes and all these different dynamics instead of just claiming you're going to have jobs, jobs, jobs. It's simply not going to happen. And that's where we turn back to storytelling to engage people, to listen to people, to get their voices out, and ultimately get policymakers to hear these voices as well. So what I hear you saying is the question is, you know, who am I and where do I come from? When so often you ask people about climate, it's what can I buy and what can I do? And right. I hear you saying those are the wrong questions or different questions are who am I, who are we, and where do we come from? Exactly. And what's my connection? 
I mean, I think if you walked into the supermarket and asked people, where does the electricity come from that's generating our lights in the supermarket? A lot of people would really struggle to be able to tell you where is the nearest power plant or where is our electricity coming from? What is my connection with my food source? And where is our food coming from? And where is my waste going? You know, and so how do we get people to begin to ask that question, what is my connection? You know, I feel like, Greg, we're in a watershed moment right now. It's, it's very exciting. You know, as someone who, like you, has been working on these issues for years and decades, and you really felt like, you know, no one's listening, and there's just this tiny little uh, bubble of people, and, and it's an echo chamber, and we're not reaching a mass crowd. That's, that's all changing now. You know, the Yale Climate uh, Communications have done so many studies to show that the majority of the people are on board with us. The conservative farmers are Iowa the majority, major majority in terms of 75% recognize we have a climate emergency and we have to do something about it and it's man-made. What we're missing is the way to galvanize engagement, galvanize people to take that next step and galvanize people to support policies that are actually gonna change. And that's only I feel like can happen when we have effective climate storytelling. And, and that what I hear you saying is that that galvanizing change doesn't begin with shouting and persuading. It begins with listening exactly. and empathy. And I think the guys at, at Yale would, would say the same thing. Uh, we had them on the program recently. And, you know, so it starts with listening. And I'm interested in when you go to a, a fossil fuel community, you know, how do you practice that lead with listening rather than persuading? Right. You know, it's a great point. And once again, I, I, I revert back to my training as an oral historian that, you know, you don't know how many front porches I've sat on for hours. And as my one of my uh, dear mentors, you know, Studs Terkel from Chicago, who is really my hero in terms of oral history, you know, you listen for hours, but it's really two minutes of this incredible wisdom that you're waiting to hear from. You know, people tell you everything from A to Z and what happens with their dog. And then suddenly they have this insight that you, you, you can't even begin to, to comprehend how important it is, how profound, how different it has completely changed the way you think about something. And it's that kind of commitment that may seem tedious that to me is ultimately exciting. Uh, what I've done when I've worked with schools and universities and then worked with communities is have these listening sessions where we send people out to begin to talk to their own families and talk to their grandparents and their own parents or their own uh, extended family, and then to get in and start talking to people. Let me give you a, a quick example. You know, we uh, had two students who were agroeconomists and really serious and numbers crunchers and, and talked about things I couldn't even begin to wrap my mind. And they were really concerned about the issue of, of uh, water quality and, and the use of nitrates, which ultimately uh, we use to fertilize the land here. And then it gets into our water sources and the impact on, uh, on so much of our water quality. And these two students just had all this data and nobody wanted to read it. And I gave them a copy of the vagina monologues and they went home and they read it and they were just completely transfixed by it. And so then they went and interviewed six farmers and they created what they called the nitrate monologues. And, it was, <laughs> and they put it on stage of farmers. Well, when's the first time that you dump nitrates and tell us about that experience. And of course they had this incredible humor to it, but also just, it kind of put it in a way we never could have imagined this kind of personal experience of, okay, there's a consequence to everything we do. And there's a, an element of both hope and pleasure and, and, and destruction. And how do we begin to, to, to understand this incredible story? And this, these nitrate monologues were just opened up people's eyes about water quality and the role of industrial agriculture. It's finding these creative ways to tell these stories outside the bounds of what we're, we're traditionally told that are effective that really, I think, are going to galvanize people in the future to do something. Jeff Biggers is a journalist, playwright, and historian and founder of the Climate Narrative Project. Jeff, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. I found it inspiring and encouraging and want to do more storytelling and think about my own story and the story of people I talk to. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. You're listening to Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. While Jeff Biggers tries to get us to re-narrate our climate past and present, other writers are telling stories of an uncertain climate future. To dodge the mass extinction event is the story of my book. 
And the scientists who are trying to imagine ways to do that are the writers that Betsy is featuring in her new book. Kim Stanley Robinson is an acclaimed science fiction author whose new novel, The Ministry for the Future, takes its name from a fictional body established under the Paris Climate Agreement. When he refers to Betsy, he's talking about our other guest, New Yorker staff writer Elizabeth Colbert, whose new book is Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. She explores how the very ways in which humans have transformed and damaged the well-being of life on Earth may also hold the keys to preserving it. The book begins with water. Um, Water is just one of the manifestations of, of what we're doing and what we're anticipating. But, you know, for example, to tell one of the sort of stories from the book, we've completely shackled the Mississippi River. It's levied up for much of its duration. Its, Its tributaries are levied up. Um, it's surrounded by huge waterworks in, in, in New Orleans and, and upriver as well. And that has had the um, effect of, of keeping, you know, New Orleans relatively dry, not, not completely dry, but it's also had the effect of creating this untenable situation where the whole southern part of the state is basically sinking away because it no longer gets any of the sediment that built up that land over thousands of years. So now engineers in Louisiana are planning sort of a second set of interventions, kind of controlled flooding to counteract the effects of flood control. And and that's really um, the theme of the book, these sort of interventions that then demand new interventions on top of them. Yeah, so we're kind of engineering to undo the engineering, and we get kind of this spiral. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, your story begins with a catastrophic heat wave uh, in India. Person wakes up; it's 103 at 6 a.m. That's the coolest part of the day. Uh, so tell us there what what that you know what you're trying to what you're conveying there that story of the oppressive heat and and then how humans are interacting with each other in in such a hot and disrupted world. Well, it's also important to point out that it's the heat and humidity in combination. So it's um, that heat humidity index in combination that is quickly fatal for humans. And what I realized was when you get the um, the news from the scientists that we are soon to hit wet bulb 35 temperatures, which are fatal to humans, and then you combine it with what people have been saying, kind of the the eco-modernists or adaptationists. It's an academic slash economic crowd that was saying that humans are adaptable. We'll just adapt to anything. But they weren't factoring in this fatal inability for humans to survive at temperatures that they were imagining that we did adapt to. So I wanted to um, confront that strand of human thought with the reality that, in fact, we don't have much uh, room to spare at the at the top of the heat index. And we've already hit uh, wet bulb 34 temperatures many times, including just outside Chicago in 1995. So I was scared that something like this is going to happen and thought I would write that out as a, a stimulus to thought, let's say. Elizabeth Colbert, one person I found interesting in your book is Ruth Gates, a marine biologist who passed away while you were writing the book. She described herself alternatively as an optimist, a realist, and a futurist. You know, how did those tensions live in her work as an ocean scientist studying coral? Well, my meeting with Ruth Gates, who um, headed a marine biology lab in Hawaii, uh, really set me down the path of writing this book latest book. Um, What Ruth was trying to do uh, in in concert with an Australian scientist named Madeline uh, Van Oppen was she realized, I mean, this is, you know, no great insight, but she, she realized, look, we've changed the oceans really dramatically. We've poured a lot of heat into the oceans by virtue of pouring a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We are also changing the chemistry of the oceans by virtue of pouring a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere that ends up pretty quickly in the surface. A lot of it ends up in the surface waters of the oceans. It's acidifying the oceans. That's a phenomenon known as ocean acidification. And one group of organisms that really does not not like what's happening to the oceans, we can watch that in real time, is uh, corals, reef building corals. And coral reefs are you know, just so important. They're such a vital ecosystem. Something like 25% of all marine creatures spend part of their lives on reefs. And 
her point, you know, being an optimist, a futurist, and a realist, uh, was, look, we're not getting the heat out of the oceans in any foreseeable future. We're not getting the pH back up. And so if we want to have reefs going forward in you know, a century from now, we're going to have to now, once again, do one more set of interventions. We've intervened you know, on this global scale in the oceans. We're going to have to intervene to make corals more resilient. And they were actually trying to it was called, they called it assisted evolution and it continues, this project continues trying to sort of coax corals along uh, to become more heat resistant. Can we find more heat resistant varieties? Um, but that was sort of what got me going on this whole project was this sense of, okay, one intervention now to counter another intervention. She actually has good news about coral. I feel like these conversations can get really dark really fast, but there's actually some good news there. Well, certainly there's good issues. Of that. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, some corals, her, her point was, and, is a, and you know, it's, a, it's an important one. Look, yeah, you know, half of corals on a reef may be dead, half are alive. Those half that have survived may have some, you know, it could be sheer luck, could be, you know, microclimates or whatever that we don't understand, or it could be, you know, genetic resistance to heat, heat tolerance. Uh, we need to try to find out what it is, and we need to see if we can spread that, basically, to preserve what is left of reefs. Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, you write about this dark future. Do you think that the 1% can insulate and protect themselves from the kind of future that you depict in your climate fiction? Will their kids live if the current system continues? No, this is a fantasy of escape or protection. It won't work. Um, the, the already these um, the one percent imagining that um, you know their sperm counts are thirty percent of what their grandfather's sperm counts were, and so the idea you could build a wall, as our dearly departed once said, is a is an impossibility and a kind of fantasy of escape. Uh, but mine is not a dark, uh, really. My my novel is a kind of a best case scenario. It was the, it, I conceived of it as being the the most hopeful outcome for the next thirty years that you could still believe in, given where we are now. And it, and it relates very closely to uh, Betsy's new book because one, somewhere in it, one of her scientists says a a future is coming where nature is no longer fully natural. So this is one definition of the Anthropocene, and we're all in the Anthropocene now, very clearly. And essentially, Betsy's previous book on the sixth great mass extinction event that we are now initiating, a lot of people are trying to imaginarily engineer their way out of that. To dodge the mass extinction event is the story of my book. And the scientists who are trying to imagine ways to do that are the writers that Betsy is featuring in her new book. So we're, we're both being driven by the state of the world situation now to a similar place. You're listening to a conversation about telling climate stories. This is Climate One. Coming up, how to avoid or perhaps embrace the cliches of climate storytelling. It doesn't matter what it's about. It could be about famine, could be about genocide, could be about you know environmental catastrophe. Look up, sort of pretend to have an epiphany and say, really, this is a story about hope. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. We're talking about creating new climate narratives with two expert storytellers, Kim Stanley Robinson, an award-winning science fiction author best known for his Mars trilogy. His most recent book is The Ministry for the Future. And Elizabeth Colbert, a veteran staff writer at The New Yorker who won a Pulitzer Prize for her book, The Sixth Extinction. Her latest is Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. Despite her successes, Betsy, as Kim calls Elizabeth, still grapples with how to make something as huge as global climate disruption about human beings and their stories. I've spent a lot of time over the last 15 years or so out in the field with scientists. It's not a particularly original <laughs> technique, um, it's, but I think that it helps. Um, you know, so often we're on a voyage of discovery. Often I'm out with um, people who are trying to learn something at the edge of what's known. 
Um, you know, that's a pretty standard journalistic um, technique has that. So we, we personalize it by, by going on a journey. I'm on the journey. Usually there's a protagonist on the journey who's, who's trying to answer a question. So we're on a quest. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of good climate journalism that's been done by talking to people once again on the front lines of climate change. Um, you know, who's getting heard? I think they're we should be telling more of those stories in an age of COVID, you know, that's hard. And then an age where we're, we shouldn't necessarily be flying around the world, that's hard. So some of these values, I think we have to also acknowledge, you know, come into conflict. So there are no easy answers here, you know, ethically or journalistically. Um, but I think that, you know, all narratives, and it's a complicated one, it's very complicated in terms of writing the sixth extinction, to be honest, and it also gets back to that question of giving voice to creatures who have no voice, who cannot speak, you know, in a human language, in any human language, um, and how do you make their stories uh, present to people? And that is so. That's a struggle that I've had for a long time. And once again, in the case of how do you bring non-human stories to life, there are many ways to do it. You know, you can hang out with a lot of non-human creatures. You can hang out with scientists who are studying non-human creatures. Rachel Carson has a, a book, one of her lesser known books is where she actually tries to tell a story from the perspective of a bird. You know, so there are many ways people have tried to get around this problem, but it is a pretty big problem. Kim Stanley Robinson, is writing about this cathartic for you? Does it make you more or less anxious to sit and write sort of, you know, about these intense uh, future? You say it's the most optimistic future. Um, does that help? It does. Uh, I like to write and um, everybody translates their perceptions and their experiences into language in their own stream of consciousness. We are really linguistic uh, mammals. And so um, everybody experiences the same expressiveness. If you can say it, uh, you don't feel it as a confusion. So uh, clarity itself is always a virtue. Um, and when I look at the various possible futures going forward from this moment, because that's what my genre does, um, I see very clearly that the spread of possible futures is stupendously broad, ranging from a, uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian disaster to a, a prosperous, uh, increasingly uh, just and sustainable civilization. That's the confusion of our time. That Everybody feels that. Nobody's oriented. It, what it does is it, it, it means the stakes are really high right now and in this decade, because we're going to begin to slope down in one direction or another and make it harder and harder if we slope in the bad direction, harder and harder to crawl back over the peninsula to the good side. So um, I think um, this is a universal feeling. It's the, it's the topic of our time. In a way, that's a good sign, because 20 years ago, when you're writing about this, then you're just a, a journalist off on a wild um, goose chase, or you're a science fiction writer portraying an implausible future. Now everybody's there, so um, it's a, you know it's it's kind of inescapable. Elizabeth, you quote uh, a scientist that says he feels pressure to have a happy ending. The people need hope. Uh, do you feel pressure to have hope in your writing? Do you ever fake it? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure anyone's ever accused me of that before, Greg. Um, <laughs> you know, I will, I, there's a lot of ways I could answer it, but I, I will answer it with a, with a story. So several years ago, the filmmaker, um, Steven Soderbergh gave a, a speech, which was, you know, supposedly his valedictory to Hollywood, but I, I don't think it really turned out to be that, but anyway, and it was supposed to be private, but of course it was printed everywhere. And he was very down on Hollywood. And at the end, he, gave this piece of advice sort of, you know, very much tongue in cheek, but his advice to young filmmakers was, whenever you go in and you pitch a movie to Hollywood executives, um, it doesn't matter what it's about. It could be about famine, could be about genocide, could be about, you know, environmental catastrophe. Look up, sort of pretend to have an epiphany in the middle of the meeting and say, really, this is a story about hope. And that's how you pitch a movie. And it was, you know, a very bitter commentary, obviously. But I think it gets to a pretty important 
point, which is that, you know, Americans are tremendous, we are a tremendously hopeful society, perhaps because we've been trained by Hollywood, perhaps we're just, you know, congenitally hopeful. Um, and we're also, you know, the single biggest contributor to climate change in the sort of aggregate. And those, so those things don't, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And I'm not sure that what our problem is, is a lack of hope. Our problem is a lack of doing anything. But I want to drill it, you know, this word, you know, words obviously matter. You're authors, you're, you know, uh, masters of crafting words. And the, the word solution, we, Kim Stanley Robinson, we hear solution a lot. And you referenced before that we're, we're in a world where nature is no longer natural. We're questioning whether natural disasters are really natural. You know, is there such a thing as a solution? Is that even deceiving ourselves? Because so much of the climate conversation is aimed towards solutions. And I wonder sometimes whether even that word, like we can solve it and fix it and go back to the way it was. I even wonder whether the word solution is delusional. Yeah, solution is the wrong word. Um, one of uh, Betsy scientists talks about different ways that we rate species on the edge of extinction. And one of them is conservation uh, reliant. In other words, that species wouldn't be alive unless humans had intervened to keep them alive. And I, my favorite example is the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep, which I've seen one time in a meadow, 10% of all of the living members of that species. And um, it was down to 100 individuals, and now it's up to about 600. So um, it's another a quote from Betsy's book, the choice isn't between what used to be and what is, it's between what is and what will be. So it's, I talk about coping. We're in a situation where we have to cope and try to uh, avoid mass extinctions any way we can, and then hope that the next generations will use that as scaffolding to uh, even better coping mechanisms. So solution is sort of like a word out of mathematics. An equation has a solution. A crossword puzzle has a solution. It implies closure and finality. And, and so it's it really is quite the wrong word. There is, not only is there not one solution, there, is, there aren't any solutions. There's just coping mechanisms. Which, Elizabeth, takes us to a very, you know, hard place to the idea that this this change is permanent, it's with us, that we can't kind of somehow roll it back and make it, we can't, you know, there's this whole question of environmental melancholia, right? We kind of long or, or grieve things that, that have been lost to us, and we somehow think we can bring them back. I'd like to have your response to that. Well, I, I completely agree with Kim that this is, you know, we have a kind of mindset of, let you know, let's buy gum, let's lick this thing. And climate change, above all else, I think, in terms of, you know, problems that we've faced, it just doesn't fit that mold. Geophysics just doesn't allow for that, right? So we're already very far down this path. We have not seen all the warming, you know, that we've already committed ourselves to. Each day we commit ourselves to more warming. Um, we're not going back, you know, in any foreseeable future unless, I mean, the only thing that we, we could theoretically do uh, is some form of, you know, solar geoengineering that would perhaps bring temperatures back, but certainly wouldn't bring the world back to the state that we once knew it. How's that? It would be a whole new world, a brave new world. And I think that, you know, definitely one of the points that I'm trying, messages I'm trying to, to get at um, through the stories I tell in uh, Under a White Sky is we kind of are between a rock and a hard place. You know, whichever way we choose to go, we're in committed very deep in a lot of these systems, you know, we've mucked with them so profoundly. We're not getting them back in any foreseeable future, but it's also unclear if we're going to do good by mucking further. All of those things are unclear. Elizabeth Colbert has been a staff writer at The New Yorker for over 20 years. She won a Pulitzer Prize for her book, The Sixth Extinction. Her latest book is Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. Kim Stanley Robinson is an acclaimed science fiction author best known for his Mars trilogy. His most recent book is Ministry of the Future, which looks at a new international agency created to protect future generations from a planet literally burning up. 
Kim Stanley Robinson, in your book, India starts to dip into um, geoengineering. So tell us uh, what that is and how close do you think we are to seeing it um, in real life? Well, if indeed we're in the Anthropocene, we're a major force in the climate of this biosphere, then uh, stuff that we do at scale, it's all geoengineering. If, um, if women everywhere on this planet have their full set of human rights, um, as guaranteed by the UN Declaration of Human Rights, then the population naturally starts to go down and then there's less pressure on the biosphere that women's rights are geoengineering, justice is geoengineering, and also throwing dust up into the atmosphere to deflect some sunlight. That's definitely engineering by any definition and is the classical example. So um, the dust, you can choose which kind of dust you throw up there into the stratosphere. And it looks like, I learned this from Betsy's book, which is a great factoid to know that maybe um, calcium carbonate, limestone dust, which we already have in the atmosphere, is maybe the most benign substance. You imitate a volcanic explosion. Temperatures drop for a few years. You can't create a snow piercer event and freeze the planet by accident. These are fantasies. And very often science fiction shades into fantasies in very unuseful ways. But what you could do is perhaps reduce the chance of that wet bulb 35 mass death event and buy some time. So, so people are scientists of various kinds, especially more speculative scientists, are beginning to look into various methods for lowering the temperature for a while and maybe escaping some mass, mass death events while we get through the whole decarbonization. So it sounds like you obviously would support research and development because some people say that even uh, starting to research and fund geoengineering might create sort of the inevitability that it will be deployed. How many times have humans uh, developed technology and then never used it? Well, that's, how, that's okay, but this is part of the moral hazard argument. The usual argument against it is, well, if we develop a method to mitigate um, by, by these geoengineering, then we'll just keep on burning carbon. Well, that's an old argument. It's about 10 to 15 years out of date now. We are in an all-hands-on-deck situation. These scientists are studying emergency gestures like uh, breaking the fire alarm and putting um, fire extinguisher chemical on a situation. Well, that fire extinguisher chemical, you don't want to breathe it. You don't want to live it forever. You use it in an emergency to kill a fire. So um, these various kind of pseudo philosophical objections, the, the moral hazard, etc., cetera, um, they're knee jerk reactions. Science has always invented cool new things like pumping oil out of the ground and energizing your entire economy and, and increasing the population by a factor of five in a hundred years, public health, all these great innovations lead to unexpected problems. And then you got to re-engineer it and you got to keep on coping. So um, I have no patience for that, for that strand of argument. Elizabeth Colbert, what do you see as the most plausible ways forward? If it's not, you know, fundamental uh, radical revolution, do you think that our systems can uh, bring forward the changes? We have the solute, we have the, I want to say solutions. Uh, you know, we we have tools, uh, but it seems like we lack the political will to to implement them. I think that's the question, and I. I don't have a clear answer. Obviously, you know, in a theoretical sense, we could certainly, you know, for example, the very basic question of carbon emissions, could the world, could the US, let's just stick with the US, which remains the world's second largest emitter right now, uh, could we bring our emissions all the way down to zero over the next few, several decades? Certainly that is possible. I, I believe that that is completely possible. Is it going to happen? Your guess is as good as mine. I, I really don't know. And I applaud the positive vision. I, and I completely agree that there would be many potential social benefits from completely remaking you know, our infrastructure and really re radically rethinking uh, either under the you know, rubric of capitalism or not how we live. But I also think we have to be frank and say that American politics uh, right now, you know, Joe Biden won a very narrow victory in the practicality of getting things done before a midterm election that I'm sure the Democrats are already very, very nervous about. So I think that unfortunately, while the time 
demands bold moves and maybe we will get some bold moves. I also think that we're, you know, potentially in this seesawing politics, which we've seen now for a long time, you know, a Bush administration, an Obama administration finally gets around to doing something on climate in the last few years of the administration. The Trump administration undoes all of that. We have to start again. I mean, it's really, we do not have time for this kind of nonsense. We've been talking about climate storytelling with Elizabeth Colbert, staff writer for The New Yorker and author of the new book, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, and acclaimed science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson, whose newest novel is The Ministry of the Future. To hear more Climate One conversations, subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the climate conversation. Kelly Pennington directs our audience engagement. Tyler Reed is our producer. Sarah Catherine Coxon is the strategy and content manager. Steve Fox is director of advancement. Devin Strolovich edited the program. Our audio team is Mark Kirshner, Arnav Gupta, and Andrew Stelzer. Dr. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.